So this was one that was described in 2010 um, in an adult with left-sided chest pain. And what do you guys think is going on here? Right. So when an adult presents with chest pain, he very you know, intuitively reached for a face array probe doing a focused cardiac scan. Um, and the heart looked fine, but then um, in, and in the subcostal, um, in the subsiphoid view, it was fine. But then when he looked in the parasternal area, um, he got this flickering phenomenon where the heart was clearly visible um, in late diastole, but then it disappeared in mid systole. Um, and then it re reappear again, giving this like beat to beat variation in the visual visualization of the heart. And he suspected that, it, that this was because um, air was being transiently interposed between the chest wall and the heart during um, the cardiac cycle. So I thought that was pretty cool. We'll, um, sometimes find that described too with uh, pneumomediastinum. Pneumomediastinum, pneumo right. So when the heart comes in between. Um, I still remember the child that was trying to look for his heart. We didn't find it until now. <laughs> yeah, the pneumomediastinum. Yeah, this this is is why. Why. Right, so when something is odd, um, definitely look a little bit harder. So when he thought, he thought that that was odd, he changed to a linear probe and he confirmed that um, there is definitely a lung point there. Um, so just to summarize, you see the heart point because in diastole, the heart fills with blood. So it enlarges enough for the our air to be displaced um, from the pericardial space. And so you see the heart. And then in diastole, when the heart contracts, um, the air within the pneumothorax fills the space between the heart and the anterior chest wall. So you don't um, see the heart transiently. I thought that was pretty neat. And then you also um, have, you can also see this hydro point um, when there is um, uh, pneumothorax and it's beside a pleural effusion. So for example, in like a hemopneumothorax patient, you could have this um, pleural effusion appearance um, on one side um, and pneumothorax on the other with absent lung sliding, of course. Um, and so um, case four involves a 10 year old boy that was in a high, feet, high speed uh, motor vehicle collision. Um, he had multiple other injuries and on exam, you found that he was in, he had increased workup breathing, he was saturating in the low 90s and there was bruising to the chest. So while you're waiting um, to get the chest x-ray because there were other um, management priorities, um, you wanna get a sense of whether this increased workup breathing is from um, you know, a contusion or is it a hemothorax or is it pneumothorax? And this is often um, a good time to bring in your probe. And so this is actually um, a trauma that we recently had uh, where this child um, had these findings that were very suggestive of um, pulmonary contusion. Versus this finding, if you saw this, what would you be more suspicious for? Yeah, and so let's say he um, had the bruising and a lot of pain there. If he had a rib fracture, he could have definitely um, sustained a hemothorax. And so um, this is a phase array probe when you look in um, the upper quadrants, um, extending your probe up towards the lung can give you this spine sign where you see the extension of the spine where um, in normal lung, you shouldn't see because there is just air, but then when there is fluid within the lung, you see that transmission and you can see that um, extension of the spine um, above the diaphragm. Here's another example of the spine sign, that little triangle there um, to the left of the screen. And it's also possible that when you scan, you see fluid both um, in the chest and in the abdomen um, in those multi-system traumas. So moving on to our second last case, um, consider a four month old um, with an uh, unrepaired uh, tetralogy of the low who presents with respiratory distress and fever. And because of this um, query viral illness, he had decreased PO intake. And you were wondering about giving some fluids, but at this time, you know, you're not sure if it's actually he's dry um, or if he's um, actually in um, congestive heart failure from his unrepaired TOF. And so when you look in the lungs and you see this appearance, 
it may um, lean you against um, a little bit away from giving fluids and thinking about pressors and involving cardiology sooner rather than later. In a similar but different scenario, so let's say it's a six-year-old boy with delay um, who presents with fever and vomiting and diarrhea for seven days, um, and you've already given three boluses and he's still in shock, and at this point you want to um, continue to bolus, but then um, you want to get a sense of um, kind of have a target um, in terms of when you want to start thinking about pressors. This is also a time when um, poking the lungs, looking um, for uh, uh, pulmonary edema can also be helpful um, in your um, guide as to um, swell, like treating to um, swell until you um, uh, you have to swell before you get well. So you can keep on giving boluses until you see this finding of um, pulmonary edema. So those are the five main um, lung applications that we wanted to go over. But then to mention some of the other um, applications as well. So um, in the adult literature, they often describe this blue protocol, which was described by Lichtenstein, um, first, I think, in 1999. Um, also six views, but in a bit of a different area than the six views that we are more used to, because it tends to be the critically ill patient in the ICU, often intubated. Um, and blue stands for bedside lung ultrasound in emergency in the critically ill patients. And they talk about um, using the B profile, the A profile, um, B just adding for, you know, more B lines, A for more A lines, um, and then a mixed picture. And then using this algorithm, um, you can derive um, a diagnosis for why um, a patient might have respiratory distress. And um, they quote this blue protocol to about 90% accuracy in adult critically ill population. Yeah. Um, what, what's the C profile? Um, so C profile. Like it's A, B. What's C? A mix. So A, B is kind of a mix where you get like some areas All with right. A lines and then some areas with focal B lines. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you have kind of other findings, um, then it's more typical of pneumonia um, versus, you know, if it's strictly a B profile that's diffuse, it's more pulmonary edema. So they use it just like a, as a general mm -hmm. algorithm to guide. But the, te um, the technique like. The same? The same, but then the zones are a bit different. So, um, because these tend to be like supine patients that are sometimes intubated or in a lot of distress, they look at these six zones. Um, they can't really completely maybe sit the patient up, but they look at the posterior axillary line. Instead of the mm -hmm. um, the Shinstein did describe this um, blue protocol in um, the NICU population, the neonatal critically ill. Um, so it's a good mental model, to, mental model to consider, but it's not really validated in our PEM population. Here's another um, good incidental finding that was picked up by um, one of our um, focus faculty, Cherise Kwan. What do you guys think? Some yeah, so he, so this is a patient with congenital diaphragmatic hernia where um, you see these abnormal um, bowel loops within the, the, thor the thorax. Here's a patient, um, another application, um, a drowning, a, a patient that came in um, post-drowning and um, she had respiratory distress um, and was found to have this pneumonitis on, X, on ultrasound. Here's another cool case of a 10 year old boy um, who presented with descended neck veins for a few days, but otherwise had no symptoms. And so when um, we scanned his heart, there was this follicular pattern, um, this lesion with follicular pattern and hyperechoic areas within it, just um, next to the heart. This is the phased array view. And then when we scan with a linear probe, this is what we see. And this is a patient that actually had a mediastinal mass um, and that being a T-cell lymphoma. <clears throat> so to discuss some pitfalls, um, pitfall number one is definitely the thymus, which a lot of the um, adult um, emerge people may not be as used to seeing, and it can often be um, confused with pneumonia. So what do you guys think this one pneumonia. looks like? This is a pneumonia. How do you know that this is not the thymus? Not, it's less organized, doesn't have the real starry sky. 
experience. Mm -hmm. As compared to this structure, right? More defined and starry more, sky. Exactly. They often describe this starry sky appearance, more well-defined borders. Compared to something like this, where um, the borders are much more irregular with focal beelines, and you often have these um, air or um, fluid bronchograms within. Thymus. Here's another example of thymus. Now you're going to show us thymus animal here? <laughs> <laughs> you're taking away the surprise. Oh, oh so, surprise. So. Sorry, sometimes we can see both. So. This is an example of um, one that oops, that um, one of our focus faculty, Greg Harvey, saw, where the um, the thymus is juxtaposed to an ammonia on the right of the screen, and these are some of the features that um, Pezzo was mentioning. Um, sometimes it can be tricky, but the more that you see, um, the easier it is that you will be able to recognize um, what's pneumonia versus thymus. So pneumonia is looking more um, hepatized versus stereo sky appearance and thymus. Um, pneumonia having more dirty borders, um, appearing in any age, and it can be anywhere versus thymus tends to be um, having clean borders in younger kids, and it often has um, a very um, localized um, anterior chest uh, location. Second pitfall would be mistaking the th stomach um, to be a pneumonia. So in this case, it might be easy that as you're coming down to confuse this structure with being a pneumonia because you have that kind of irregular border. Um, here's an example of, uh, of a pneumonia that's sitting just on top of the diaphragm. And so when it's in these locations, it can be tricky. Just make sure um, to just trace the lesion up and look at that border um, to see whether it's diaphragm or um, pleural lining. Um, and just be mindful of um, the stomach when you're scanning the left. Um, the third pitfall is that um, there could be central pneumonias that may be missed when you're uh, just doing the six views, um, when the lesion does not abut the chest wall. But again, arguably, these may be so small that it may not be clinically relevant. Um, another thing that can minimize its pitfall would be to um, whenever you see focal either beelines or small subpleural lesions to um, really look around that area to make sure you're not missing the beginning of a pneumonia. Um, and you can also employ the, um, the zigzag method um, to cover more ground um, since we're only doing the longitudinal approach. So review, just to summarize what we've gone over. So um, we reviewed the um, the performance of um, how to do a lung focus uh, using a linear probe and the six views. Um, we reviewed five cases to demonstrate um, the core applications, including pneumonia, pleural effusion, pneumothorax, um, trauma, pleural uh, and pulmonary edema. Um, and we also went over some pitfalls at the end there um, to keep in mind that um, the thymus and the stomach can be confused with the pneumonias. Um, and that central pneumonias can be missed. So definitely be more mindful when you have small findings. Um, and this is, again, the link to sign in if you uh, would like to register for the um, Section 1 activity with the Royal College. And that brings us to the end. Thank you for your attention.